Hello, you are watching Hornbill TV's newsroom. On the 10th of October, which was also celebrated as World Mental Health Day, a college student who was taking part in a race organized by NGO Gracious Life Foundation was abducted, allegedly, by three NSCNK cadres, beaten up and looted. In this regard, the NGO met the college student on Monday to take stock of the student's condition and the NGO also strongly condemned the incident and stated that the Naga society should introspect as to why such people involved in such criminal activity. On Bill TV has been bringing you such stories where various Naga national political groups have been involved in such activities and how the Naga public have raised concerns over such incidents. In today's newsroom, we shall look into the increasing violence against civilians by Naga national groups and to try and understand why these incidents are increasing. And to talk more on this, we've got our associate editor, Al Muli, who will be joining me on this newsroom to speak more on this issue. Uh, first of all, good morning, sir. Thank you so much for joining me on this newsroom. Uh, the October 10 incident, sir, it was a pretty uh, sad, it was a sad day, and especially on October 10th, it was also World Mental Health Day. Somehow, the mentality side of it seems to have been punctured rather than mended. Uh, do you think that these are some of the activities that these groups are taking part to try and uh, to give rise to the culture of fear again? Or do you think this is a perfect example? Do you think that this is the perfect example of the saying that uh, there are some rotten apples in each society and these, uh, this one, this particular incident is a case of that particular example? Do you believe uh, these cases are increasing in society these days? Uh, there are a lot of different elements at play here. Uh, it's unfortunate for the student because this, this was expected, Akivay. Because I remember those days, I think it was in 2007 and 2008, the our students' community and the social organizations representing the Naga, our Naga community took out protests during the time demanding justice for a person, I think he was a doctor, who was shot by underground, one of the underground organizations, Akivay. So, during this time, I remember that the statements that were issued in the media at a time where they said it will, it will become a practice. It will be an event that will consider that we will we will come to consider normal if we don't act right now. That the underground act the underground elements are now committing crimes that now you cannot brush it away as part of the political process. Yes. Beating up people has nothing to do with sovereignty or the political process. Yes. Extorting from people, shooting people, this comes under law and order. Okay. Yes. So, uh, unfortunately, the threat system, as I call it, the fear system has come to such a point that now there are people who see it as a normal event in a fast developing urbanized society. Now, as I was saying earlier, uh, there are a lot of elements at play. Why are these activities against civilians increasing? First thing, there is no law and order. Because we may have police, we may have patrolling, that's not law and order. They are just very superficial outward, outward elements of urban living. We don't have law and order in the sense that there is no swift enforcement activities that make sure that these kind of uh, events do not repeat. <laughs> We don't have a government that acts swiftly in this regard. We don't have a government that represents the frustration, the expression of frustration of the people. So when criminals uh, engage in this kind of activities, it means that there is no one to check them and they have no, they, they don't fear the government or the society and they know that they can get away with it. So that's the whole idea of having a law and order 
system in place because when you have the system in place it means that criminals will think twice yes. before breaking the law they are going to fear the judiciary they are going to fear the outrage from the community they are going to fear some kind of a recourse but in this case because the cases are increasing we don't see any kind of such fear there is no one to check them and that is why now we are hearing of oh, like brazen extortion activities in a broad daylight yes. we are now hearing of civilians being assaulted and most of these are people who claim to be freedom fighters yes. we have had people being threatened with their lives we have had and we continue to have extortion activities at gunpoint yes. so uh, it is a very sad situation that involves I think the community and the government, the public, the youth to come together to start thinking to do something or otherwise all this will continue. All right, sir, you put out a very interesting point. Uh, you talked about law and order, sir. Okay, uh, just recently the central government introduced three new criminal laws, the Bharat Nyaya Sanhita, the BNSS and the, the, that replaced the 1800s uh, Indian Evidence Act, the Criminal Procedure Act. Well, when we talk about law and order and the enforcing agencies, do you think that the Naga society is juxtaposed in such a way that there is law on one side that belongs to the government of India and then another, there is another law that belongs to the Naga national group? Do you think the Naga society, the common Naga public is sandwiched in between these two laws and which is why uh, there is always a lopsided uh, point of view when we talk about law and order and also uh, do you think this is one of the reasons why even uh, the police or the Naglin police find it difficult to execute their duties? Yeah, definitely. And that's why they say uh, the police, they have complained. Yes. And this is a very common complaint even during our reporting days too. What can we do? I remember a police officer at the Dimapur station. He was a station officer during the time, and now he is uh, promoted and he is now in the police headquarters. And I remember meeting him in the railway station during one of uh, one of those drug, smugg drug smuggling cases that I was sent to report to AKV. Yes. And he said, we do our job. We bring them in, and the next thing, they're let off. They're led off. And it doesn't matter who you are. You are just led off. It's so easy to, I don't understand the various components and the laws that, the regulations that, uh, that govern this kind of activities. I'm not a lawyer. But one thing I do know is that during the time I remember we were speculating the number of people being led off for extortion activities, for possessing arms or for, sh for shooting someone or for threatening someone with their life the level of and the magnitude of cases involving people being let off was so high, we started wondering, and I think there was also an article during that time questioning, you know, why are these peeping, uh, people being let off? Why are these people being given bail? And those, most of them were serious cases, especially threat to life, and even a murder, I think, a GB was shot dead, and later it emerged that it was a mistaken identity. Nobody did anything. So, when we talk of laws, uh, I, I think right now, considering the situation in Nagaland, we have the, we don't have the Indian Penal Court anymore. Yes. But of course, law is still law, and then its replacement has come in. Yes. But I think it's a technical point of view in that regard. The the new laws will be implemented and there are no changes in regard to removing enforcement when it comes to law and order but the law is still there but i agree with you that uh, in Nagaland, i don't think that law applies much as you said we are always sandwiched in between yes. the government doesn't have a say it, it does not have a statement of weight that will support the public in these times and like i said the police on their part they will do their job provided there is some kind of a strong government leadership that represents what the people want, a peaceful, enforcement-led society. But unfortunately, like I said, we have not been seeing 
that 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 much of it we have we have too many governments we have too many people wanting to be presidents and chairmen and chief ministers and home ministers we have too many people there is there is a whole lot of parallel governments running in Nagaland yes. and that is why it is difficult and when you have too many laws government governing the people it means you're opening yourself to too many criminal activities being forced on the public all right so on the other aspect of it uh, over the past few years or over the uh, receding months that just took place uh, do you find a change in the perception of the public when it comes to uh, standing up for themselves because over the past we have seen that or rather we have witnessed that whenever it comes to uh, topics such as the naga national political groups in the society it's always hush hush but over the past few years we've seen atrocities taking place and uh, we've seen unions or even organizations or frontal bodies coming up and standing up against such activities that are committed by uh, members of various naga national political groups the most recent one was in kohima uh, after uh, a contractor was given a death penalty by one of the groups the most recent one was here in dimapur where uh, the dibupar dayo or rather dibupar our youth organization stood up against the nscn case threatening and extortion and the kidnapping over two of its members who were believed to have not been giving their taxes so do you believe that the perception of the naga society and the naga public is changing with regards to the fact that when these uh, naga national political groups commit such atrocities they are no more going to sit quiet they will stand up and protest do you think that this is the right way forward for the naga society yeah i think nobody owns anyone's ideology yes. and i cannot force my ideology on you and i think this is something the younger generation of nagas are realizing yes. and there is a sense of individualism that is slowly emerging from the 18 to 35 age groups and these people were not their way back in the 80s yes and you cannot expect them to look at the nationalist movement or the nationalist groups the way people let's say from my generation upward looked at them now for these young people they don't know the history of uh, the nationalist groups they don't know the naga story so it is easier for them to judge only the naga groups based on their actions they may have heard of the indian army those days yes the atrocities but they don't have that emotional intensity to be able to connect to those kind of stories with the indian government yes. and i think that this is what the naga groups should consider seriously because this generation is going to rise up and it is slowly slowly rising up to put their foot down as we saw what happened in kohima yes. regarding the case of the contractor who was given the death penalty yes. we have seen what happened in divubar yes so people are slowly rising up because they know that the government they elected will always be this just a bunch of puppets puppets to their own fear puppets to their own business interest yes. puppets to their own thirst and hunger for power for which they have to try to please everyone that somewhere along the way you lose where it comes to law and order and that's where the public they feel they are left alone the courts are not there for them the police are not there for them so these young people your generation they are eventually going to rise up and say enough is enough and i think uh, especially uh, considering what the angami youth organization did the dibubar youth organization did these people are going to rise up and they're going to break through that iron curtain of fear yes. and it will it, it might not happen it might happen but one thing is clear there are a lot of people who don't agree with what the naga organizations are doing in the name of nationalism yes. but i tell you akivi you've heard of the arab spring 
Yes. You have heard of the Mexican Revolution. Yes. You have heard of all these cultural movements, as violent as they are, they were all spread. They, they did not just come about just like that. They all spread from a single trickle that started somewhere. The Arab Spring, for example. Yes. It started with one single pause on Twitter. Mexican Revolution, it started with a mother in a kitchen in a small town in Mexico complaining about the government. Yes. So we have to always be careful to, we have to be really careful when it comes to taking the people for granted. You can fool them one day, you can fool them for maybe two years, you can even fool them for 20 years, but eventually down the line in history, somebody is going to make a stain. And that person who puts his foot down is going to bring you down. All right, so another activity, uh, another alarming activity, or rather uh, quite a viral activity that is also happening is amongst the Naga national political groups. Well, we've got various factions at the moment uh, throwing barbs at each other, criticizing each other, even putting insinuations against each other. Well, they've got their own internal conflict too that is... Uh, which is uh, going quite viral amongst at least the journalistic society. If you look at it, the NSCA and unification, uh, there are now two groups that are claiming to be the original one. Then you look at the NNCFGN where you've got a group that supports Singh, uh, uh, Mr. Singh, yeah? and there's another group that does not support Mr. Singh. Yeah? Do you believe that with such increasing activity, even amongst the Naga national political groups, do you feel that this whole essence of the Naga movement, uh, which is slowly diminishing in the Naga society and amongst the Naga public, do you feel that with such activities taking place amongst the Naga national political groups itself, the already minimal uh, belief that is there amongst these groups and amongst the Naga public that, okay, these groups will fight for Naga nationalism, do you think this is also going to erode as soon as possible? Then that is the reason why I said your generation, Akivi. The 18 to 35 generation, they don't believe that the leaders from the past who represent the Naga story, yes. the Naga nationalist stories, yes. are doing what they promised to do, are representing us in the way they project themselves to be. Yes. That is why I'm saying the coming generation is going to erode, they're going to make a stand they're going to see enough is enough of all these criminal activities, the assault, the beatings, the fear, the gun culture, because they don't have any sentimental connection with what happened there yes. during, uh, during the past 30, 40 years. Or I, I don't think they even know much of the story about the 50s and 60s. So they are not connected with the Naga story. Yes. So that is why it will be easier for your generation to spot the hypocrisy, the criminal activities that is going on. And they are going to say, uh, no, I don't think you're doing the right thing. I don't think you're working for the Naga, uh, the Naga peoples. I don't think you stand for our nationalist virtues. Yes. And these people are going to come along and they're going to put their foot down. And somewhere in the new future, there will be a movement that will greatly undermine the Naga nationalist organization's work. And uh, I keep saying, with, as you mentioned, with all this many and varied and diverse and myriad groups of nationalist organizations coming up, each claiming to be yes. the savior of the people. How are you going to expect us to spot you if the only way for us to spot you to be the right representative for us is your good work? Yes. Then where are your good works? So what are the parameters what are the elements of work that we need to be able to see from you, expect from you? What are the good behavior that we need to see from you so that we would say, oh, you are the one that will represent us. You are the voice of the Naga nationalist ambitions and the aspirations that we have. Oh, you are the original one. So what are you giving us? What good behavior are you showing us for you, for us to be able to appreciate you? So. I think the nationalist group should really seriously sit down and consider what they're doing. I think they should really go back to the people. 
I think this time recon reconciliation should be with the people, yes. not just among themselves. Otherwise, no, they need to win the trust of the people, the confidence of the people, because all these things that have been happening, it didn't happen just a month ago. They are not something that happened um, after like 70, 80 years. It didn't happen just like that. It has been happening for my time. <clears throat> All right, so uh, in another aspect of it, uh, as children, we went through history books and then we learned that uh, the British, when they had occupied India and when they were occupying India, they followed the divide and rule policy. Now, after independence, uh, various Naga national political groups have alleged that the Indian government is using the divide and rule policy even amongst the Nagas. Now, with the fact that we've got more than 24 plus uh, Naga national political groups, uh, I actually don't have the uh, exact figure, but I assume it is more than 24. Uh, do you believe that with such increasing number of groups, isn't the Naga national political groups also using the same tactic of divide and rule amongst the Naga society? And who are we supposed to follow? Yeah, I mean, Jesus said, remove that lock from your eyes and then you can clearly see enough to remove that plank in your brother's eye. So, uh, I don't want to go into the political process of it, the political dynamics of it. I'm not qualified to speak on that. But one thing I'm very clear, Akivya, and one thing you will be very clear is, if an underground cadre comes and beats you up, you're not going to think about the British divide and rule. Yes. You're not going to think about the military atrocities that the Indian government perpetuated on you. If an underground cadre comes to you threatening you with your life if you don't give him 50,000 rupees, you're not going to think about the British Empire yes. or the Constitution of India. You're going to think this person from this nationalist group assaulted me. He threatened me. He took away my heart earned money. You're not going to think about anything else. You're not going to think about philosophy or the political dynamics of rule. So, what we have here is basically uh, something that will demand more than just a political will when it comes to the negotiation. That's a di oh, the Naga peace talks. That's a totally different issue. We're here talking about atrocities committed on Naga people, on innocent civilians. They are non combatants So uh, I think the community and the society, the government should just seriously sit together and just deal with this because how many how many factions do we have now Kiwi, what was the last count 25 uh, 24 uh, as much as i know as far as i remember sir it was 24 sir 24 yes i think they're going to use up the entire alphabet exactly <laughs> yeah so uh, i think the community should really sit together and we should we should try to take a stakeholding ownership uh, of this situation, we need to sit together and just really talk if we really want to go forward in this regard. All right, sir, very briefly, because we seem to be running out of time. Well, all these atrocities are, are taking place in today's time and also in our society itself, uh, where uh, various Naga national political groups have committed or like cadres of these groups are committing such crimes. All right, so these are activities that are being done by the NNPGs, but do you believe that? Somewhere or somehow, even the government of Nagaland is responsible for such activities. Yeah, definitely. If you don't do anything, that you means you are giving lawbreakers a free hand over the people. All right, sir. Thank you so much for joining me on this newsroom today, sir, and giving us your point of view over the increasing incidence of uh, violence against civilians in Nagaland by the various Naga national political groups. Thank you so much. Well, that was our associate editor, Al Muli, and we were just speaking on the increase of uh, violence against civilians in the Naga society by the various Naga national political groups. The October 10 incident is a, an incident that should be strongly condemned. We hope that college student that was abducted, assaulted, and even looted is doing a little well and hope he can erase those memories as soon as possible. Well, uh, associate editor Al Muli just mentioned that, yes, uh, the new generation of Nagas, or ra rather the youths, are slowly standing up to such instances and incidents where uh, civilians are being harassed and violated by the Naga national political groups. And also, uh, Al had just mentioned as to how now 
these Naga national political groups, instead of reconciling with each other, should now reconcile with the people of Nagaland, win back their trust so that they can continue their movement in getting uh, their Naga national movement and also with the support and cooperation of the Naga public. Well, if the Nagas are not involved in the Naga national movement, I'm wondering who else is going to be involved in such a movement. Well, Hornbill TV will bring you more topics like this, so keep watching Hornbill TV.